My great-grandfather really was the most famous man no one's ever heard of. Now, we're not going to identify this contestant panel because to identify him would be to tip off his secret. We will call him simply Dr. X. Now, Doctor, if you will whisper your secret to me, we will show it at the same time to the folks out there. Is this some kind of a machine that might be painful when it's used? Uh, uh, yeah, sometimes it's most painful. <laughs> this is the famous Dr. Philo T. Farnsworth who invented electronic television. <laughs> and, and, sir, how old were you when you invented uh, television, or, the, or the, the first television machine as we know it today, first television uh, system? I was 14. 14 years old. It's hard to imagine the world my great-grandfather was born into in 1906. No computers, no cell phones, no cars, no airplanes, and certainly no television. When he was growing up in a log cabin in rural Utah, his primetime entertainment was staring at the moon and dreaming of the future. An electric generator and a stack of science fiction magazines fueled young Philo's imagination. Then. In 1920, at the age of 14, while harrowing a field behind a team of horses, he had a revelation. If he could train an electron to do what horses were doing and go to the end of a row, turn around, and start over, he could send pictures through the air. The next year he entered high school, and he tried to talk his way into a senior science class by describing his dream of an all-electronic television. His teacher had no idea what he was talking about, but agreed to tutor him and saved the very first drawing of a television camera. By 19, Phil had attracted investors, built a lab in San Francisco, and proposed to his sweetheart, Elma. He says, there's another woman in my life. Well, or I could faint, he said, and her name is television. The only way I see that we would have as much time together as I'd like is if you work with me, how about it? On September 7th, 1927, with my great-grandma at his side taking notes, Philo successfully transmitted an electronic image for the first time. Uh, I was so excited, I was dancing around, and, and uh, Phil <laughs> was, I, I knew from the shaking hands that he was very emotionally impacted. <laughs> but. He said, well, there you've got television. That, that was what he said. The backers said, Barnesworth, when are we going to see some money in this thing? Uh, Phil had painted a dollar sign on a slide, and that's the first thing they saw, <laughs> was a dollar sign. By 1934, he was ready to demonstrate television for the first time. Philadelphia's Franklin Institute was overflowing with people wanting to see his new miracle. Although the screen was only about a foot in diameter, the crowds were transfixed and refused to leave. We didn't realize how hard it was to get keep live uh, pictures going on television yet. We had everything from trained dogs and bears, ventriloquists and puppet shows. And there was one clear night in a full moon, and Phil turned it on the moon, and that got more of a response from the public than anything. The headline was, uh, the moon sits, sits for its first portrait. Take a picture of the moon above in May or June, then you can make a love morning, night or noon, by the light of... Popular Science presents a backstage preview of television, the newest miracle of modern electrical engineering. Technicians in the Farnsworth Philadelphia laboratories have helped to make television, the dazzling dream of the decade, a practical reality today. Mr. Philo T. Farnsworth, shown at the right, is working on the image dissector tube, a photoelectric camera tube of his own invention that distinguishes his system of television from others. It is said to be responsible for the most clearly defined television pictures. Placed in the circuit of this receiving system is a funnel-shaped cathode tube. The round, flat surface of its bulb becomes the picture screen in studio monitor sets, as well as in home receiving sets. 
The image dissector tube and the cathode oscillite tube are the heart and brain of the Farnsworth system. Television engineers are now adjusting studio equipment to demonstrate the technical routine of broadcasting a television program. Max Factor Jr. has developed a new type makeup for television photography. The photoelectronic camera, being super sensitive to red, causes that color to be absorbed. Thus, red is applied to hollows and depressions of the face to eliminate heavy lines and also to produce highlights. While blue, which reproduces darkly, is used as eyeshadow. The facial makeup of the modern movie queen makes her a dream of loveliness. But the television star has the grotesque appearance of a circus clown. The new television makeup may give the camera a break. But the wearer's first view of herself is likely to break her heart. Unless she has a sense of humor. In this camera is an image dissector tube. The camera lens picks up the artist as an image of light, causing electrodes in the dissector tube to emit electrons. Passing through station equipment, the electrons become radio impulses to be broadcast and picked up by receiving sets where the routine is reversed. The radio impulses becoming points of light that appear on the screen as pictures. 30 pictures are completed every second. These pictures are composed of 200,000 light points that strike the screen one at a time at the rate of six million points per second. Music and sound accompany the performer's action, both visible and audible elements going on the air in perfect synchronization. As the action is photographed from various angles, engineers at control board select long shots and close-ups, editing the show as it passes instantly through the station's facility. Traveling with the speed of light through a maze of tubes and equipment, the show leaves the station's sending towers to be viewed by the television public, an audience as yet small and comparatively ignorant of the enormous research and experiment that makes it possible for us to see and hear people many miles away. The most fanciful dream of mankind is today a startling reality, destined to become the world's most popular science. The RCA said, and no person, no boy of 15 could uh, come up with that uh, complicated uh, uh, concept. Uh, so Phil went to the patent office and he said, we need a ruling on this. They asked Phil if he had told anyone about his television ideas. Phil's old chemistry teacher, Justin Tolman, produced a a page of Phil's notebook where Phil had made a drawing of the camera tube. And so RCA had to get, give in on that idea. Therefore, they, they uh, made a ruling that Farnsworth was the original inventor of electronic television. He said this is the first time RCA has ever taken a license. This would be the place for a happy ending, except for a tragic twist of fate. By the time a TV standard was finally agreed on, the world was at war. The U.S. government shut down television development and converted the factories to produce radar. Phil was well aware that there was a war coming, that probably his patents would be expiring before that ended or right around shortly after. And this was very depressing to him. He had put his whole soul and life into getting television to the public. Phil Farnsworth continued to invent. He earned over 300 patents worldwide. If his atomic fuser had been successful, we might all be flying around in nuclear cars by now. He should be a household name, but despite a cartoon descendant on Futurama, he's not. Unfortunately, Philo T. Farnsworth never profited from his invention. He was squeezed out and did not participate in the growth and development of his beloved television. He refused to watch the damn thing. Then on July 20th, 1969, a miniature version of his original image dissector was used to beam live pictures back to the Earth from the moon. We were watching it when uh, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. Phil turned to me and he says, Pam, this has made it all worthwhile. Before then, he wasn't too sure. As a child, I remember being cradled in my great-grandmother's arms, asking her to tell me about Philo and everything he had achieved. This has encouraged me to continue sharing the truth about Philo, and I believe it will inspire a new generation to also believe anything is possible.
My name is Jessica, and I'm proud to be the great-granddaughter of both Philo T. Farnsworth and Alma Pem Farnsworth. 